All right, so first a few things I want to mention before we get too much into it. So I put up, so we've got this week, next week, and then that third, you know, the following week will be finals, right? So I've already got up kind of a, a folder with some practice materials. Now, we're going to cover something called match pairs today. Um, after that, all the rest of this week and next week, we're just going to be going over something called linear regression. And that final is only going to be kind of anything we've covered since that second exam. So it's a lot more limited in the scope, right? But it's really going to hit hard on hypothesis testing. It's really going to hit hard on this linear regression, um, which is a little bit different than what we've been doing. It's a little more interpretation than computation. So I think for some people, they'll find that a little bit easier. But those practice um, exams kind of questions, as well as the final formula sheet you would need are on there as well. So we'll, still, you know, we'll probably have a day or two where we'll be able to do some, some final exam review um, I might post some additional videos as we get closer to the final, but just kind of mapping out the rest of the class. Um, wanted to mention that. So, unless there's any questions from you before we get started. We good? Okay. We're going to dive into kind of match pairs. So, the idea of what we're doing is we're going to have basically a before and after time period. And it's kind of like we have two samples but it's really only coming from one population or we're having the same individuals in a before time period and an after time period. Okay. So the kind of the, the setup here I've got is let's say there was a manager and they're, they're interested in the productivity changes after they kind of move, you know, some things around the, uh, you know, change the workstation layout. They've got 10 workers and they've measured every workers before time, you know, before product, uh, productivity and then they're after productivity. So we kind of think about, I'm going to switch over to the dot cam here. Give it a second to catch up with us. All right. So what I'm kind of thinking about is I've got like my employees. All right. I don't know. Maybe this is like John, C, Mary, S. I don't know. A bunch of different names. I'm going to measure their before and after productivity. So I don't know, maybe John is like, goes from eight to 10. This is what, 15 to 11. And I have that measured for every single employee. What I'm going to do is calculate the difference for each employee, because it's the same 10 employees. So this is why it's not quite like two populations. It's two populations in the sense that I'm measuring their productivity before and after, but it's the same 10 people. So, you know, I don't know, John went up by two, Mary's productivity law, you know, went down by four. I could do that for every employee. Now what I'm gonna do is do things like calculate the average difference. So I'm back to just having one variable. Right? I've got a before and after time period. So I create this new difference variable, but then I can find the mean of that difference variable I can find the variance of that difference variable and I'll have a sample size. From here, things are going to look very similar to when we had a sample mean and all we had was a sample variance. So the notation will be a little bit different and what we are doing is something different because we're not just finding the mean of a variable, we're finding the mean of this difference variable that we created. Okay, so it's a little bit different. Instead of finding the difference in two sample means, we're finding the mean of this difference variable, okay? And you know, kind of the advantages here, right? Like we're looking at productivity changes of the same 10 employees, right? So it's not like we have 10 different employees in the before and after time period, it's the same 10, okay? Well, actually, before I go back to the slides, so using this idea, what we're gonna be thinking about is, okay, well, what's the distribution of my sample difference is going to look like? Okay. I think the way I have this notationally in the slides looks something like this. They should be centered around whatever that true mean difference is, right? I can't observe that, but it should be centered around that. Or if we do hypothesis testing, we'll say it's centered around the assumed true difference. Okay. I then can think about, okay, what's the variance 
of that sample difference. So that's just going to be the variance of the difference variable that we created over my sample size. This should look similar, very similar to when we were looking at a variance of a sample mean. We just took the original variance of the data we sampled from over my sample size. Right? And instead of a sample difference, I was looking at a sample mean and I had an assumed true mean. But other, I mean, otherwise, it's really going to be the same sort of setup. Okay? It's just now instead of an X, you know, we're going to have kind of this, this D bar, right? Because it's the average, it's the mean of this difference variable. So what's also going to be true is it's um, let's say I, I found some difference variable here uh, or some sorry sample difference here and then I wanted to turn it into a test statistic right or figure out the number of standard deviations away from the true mean it was well because we only have sample variances just like when we had sample means we only have a sample variance we should be using the student t distribution. Okay? And our degrees of freedom is going to become easier than it was when we were looking at the difference in sample means. It goes back to simply being n minus one. Okay? So really, we've basically, we're going to work through these and the process is going to look no different to when we had a single sample mean and only had the sample variance. It's going to look exactly like what we were doing then. Okay? So let's work through a couple examples. So uh, oh, sorry. Um, so, you know, using all that in mind, right, this is going to become the equation for our confidence interval. So just kind of to give you a glimpse as to where that comes from. I just said everything we do is going to look like a sample mean example. Where we only have a sample variance. So this represented the standard deviation of our sample means. Sample difference. We use the variance of the original difference variable, and this guy here represents the standard deviation of our, of our sample difference there. So it looks very similar to what we were doing before. And this is just supposed to be squared. I don't know why that turned out a little fuzzy, and I can't find the remote to this dot cam, and I couldn't. I know it's a little fuzzy today. I'm not sure why. Okay. So we'll use that confidence interval equation. Go through an example. So let's say we've got a manager, um, or we have that manager, and she finds for those 10 employees a mean difference of 8.5, you know, units of whatever they're producing, and a variance of 121. So if I want to build a 95% confidence interval for what the true mean difference is, um, assuming that before and after productivity is normally distributed, so we didn't have a, a sample size of 30, so I had to add that little part in just to ensure that we have a um, normal distribution for that um, for the sample differences, sorry, for that sample difference variable. So I've got the, uh, there we go. I've got my sample difference. I've got the variance on that difference. My sample size, I had 10 individuals. So the only other thing I need to do is look up that T value, right? Well, at the 95% confidence level, my alpha is gonna be what? It's just the area outside my confidence interval in decimal form. So. 0 0.05. So I want half of alpha on each side of my confidence interval. So alpha over two is 0 0.025. And then my degrees of freedom is simply n minus one. So 10 workers minus one. So I've got a degrees of freedom of nine and the area I want in the tail is 0 0.025. Okay. But at this point, it's really just a matter of looking that value up in my table. So I, I go to my student T table the area I wanted in the tail was 0 0.025. Scroll up, degrees of freedom of nine, 2.262. So once I have that T value, now it's just a matter of plugging everything into our equation. Subtract the margin of error to get the lower bound, add the margin of error to get the upper bound. Okay. Any questions on this? Shouldn't be too bad. Oh, sorry. Switch back to the slides and show you guys. I always forget the first time. It's almost the end of the semester and I still do it. There we go. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. So I just plug all those values in, subtract my margin of area at the lower bound, add the margin of area at the upper bound. Okay. 
So I've got this range for my confidence interval of 0.6 to 16.3. So what can I say here? Well, with 95% confidence, I can say that the true change in productivity is only positive values, right? So this, you know, changing the, the layout of this workstation is apparently was successful, was successful, right? It increased, on average, it increased productivity, right? Or on average, the difference in productivity was positive. Any questions on this? So what if we wanted to do hypothesis testing, right? We can do confidence intervals. Well, it's like I said before, it's the same thing as what we were doing with one population sample mean examples. It's just now we've got the true, not the true mean, but the true mean difference. And instead of an assumed true mean, we have an assumed true difference, right? D subscript zero. But we still have a right-tailed, left-tailed, two-tailed test we can run. Our test statistics gonna look a little bit different. So where does this come from? We can kind of, use the same idea as this confidence interval, right? So when I had a sample mean, my test statistic looks something like this, where this denominator represented the standard deviation of my sample means. So now I'll just take the sample difference minus the assumed true difference and divide by the standard deviation of those sample differences. Well, I already know what that is from our earlier look at confidence intervals. So it's just the variance on that difference variable over the sample size that I took, right? Once we plug the values in here, this test this equation looks no different than what we were doing before with those one population examples when we only had sample variances. Right? So it shouldn't be anything wildly new. Um, so I can calculate this test statistic pretty easily because I've got my sample difference, I've got my variance, I've got my sample size was 10. The only other thing in that equation is the assumed true difference here, like I said, with all two population examples, we're gonna use zero, all right? So once I plug that in, it actually becomes a little bit easier than what we were doing before with sample means. So I've got my test statistic here of 2.44. So I don't believe I have it in here. I go to another example, but let's say we wanna finish this, this hypothesis test out and not just calculate our test statistic. Let's assume we wanna test for whether or not productivity has increased. All right, so we've got a right-tailed test. We should be thinking about um, if we have a right-tailed test, so go back here. But what I wanna test for is my alternative hypothesis. So let's say I wanna test for whether or not this true mean difference is greater than zero. So I assume the opposite is true, which is that it's less than or equal to zero. So right away, I know I have a greater than sign or a right, excuse me, right tailed test. So when I'm thinking about looking up these critical values, they should be on the right side of the distribution. Right? Or because we know this distribution is centered at zero, we should have positive critical values. Okay? So we're gonna want the critical values that give us whatever alpha we want in the tail. The usual alphas would be 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. Our degrees of freedom here, well, we had 10 workers, so 10 minus one is nine. So we'll go to that table, that student T table. Uh, I don't know why that happened. We're having some technical difficulties in class here. Give me one second. Try this one more time. Okay. All right, hopefully we're good now. So the areas that we have, right, are 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. At a degrees of freedom of nine, so 1.38, 2.6, oh sorry, 1.38, 1.3, and 2.82. So I'm gonna, make this bigger in a second, but I need to have these pulled up so I can see what these are. So what we're gonna do is, we just found our critical value. So it was what? 1.38, rounded to the second decimal, 
2.83 and 2.82, right? So we can think about for a right tail test, our rejection region is the area to the right here. These correspond to the 10, 5, and 1% significance levels. Our test statistic was 2.44. So, you know, if we're plotting our test statistic, it'd be somewhere right here. So we would reject at the 10% level, reject at the 5% level, fail to reject at that 1% level. Okay. Any questions on this one? All right. Um, so that should be good for that one. Let's look at another example and work through a few of these, okay? So let's say we have um, actually, yeah, I'll do this. So let's say you've got 40 uh, Starbucks card holders and you have their calorie consumption before the calories are posted on the menu and after. You then create this difference variable and you find the mean of it. So you've got your mean difference and then you find the variance on that difference variable as well. So we've got our sample size, our different or mean difference and the sample variance on that difference. If I wanted to build a 99% confidence of where the true difference is, what, what would it be? Well, if we go back to this guy, we've got Mean difference, sample of that difference, sample size, all we need is that T value. What's our alpha gonna be? 0 0.01 for the 99% level. Half of alpha is gonna be in each side, so 0 0.005, right? So we want 0 0.005 in the, in the tail. And our degrees of freedom is that minus one, so 40 minus one is 39. Okay. Oops. So we're gonna go to that T table. We wanted 0 0.005 in each tail. Our degrees of freedom was 40 minus one, so 39, 2.708. Okay. Once we have that, it's really just a matter of plugging everything in to this equation, right? So let me go back here, right? It's just a matter of getting all those values plugged in. Once we have it, it's just, you know, being able to use, you know, comfortable using our calculator. Any questions over that? Just kind of a reminder, we were plugging it into this equation here. So, you know, I get this lower and upper bound of what, negative 1.3 and 5.5. So, I didn't bring a lot of paper, so I'm gonna try to reuse this. So 1.3 and 5.5, so. Basically what we found was negative 1.3, approximately 5.5. So what we knew is that, know is that the true mean difference is somewhere in this range. The problem is it could be a negative value, could be a positive value, it could even be zero. So with 99% confidence, all we can say here is really nothing. I mean, it could be that the average change in calorie consumption has went down, right? That it's negative, could be that it went up, the true difference is positive or it could, true difference could be that it's zero that it didn't change at all right so with a confidence interval like this we really don't have a lot of power to say much right with pretty inconclusive evidence based off of our sample okay so uh, i was also love this meme and it kind of went with this so uh if you haven't seen napoleon dynamite you should go out and watch it it's like a cult classic but I don't know. That still makes me laugh. I mean, it's really stupid, but I feel like I should, should recommend it to, to you guys. So we keep going with this example, um, and not just do confidence intervals, but we can do some hypothesis testing with it. So let's say I want to test for whether or not calorie consumption has decreased. Well, if that's what I want to test for, that's my alternative hypothesis, that that true difference is less than zero, that consumption has on average decreased, right? So I've got this left tailed test. So automatically I know my critical value should be what sign? If I'm dealing with the left side of the distribution, critical values are negative, right? So what's interesting about this is if I'm thinking about 
looking up these critical values, I know that they should be negative, right? If I go back, what, um, oh, hold on. So if we go back far enough, what I had the setup was when I'm looking at this sample difference, I've assumed that that true mean difference is zero. I found a sample change of, I think it was, was it 2.1? Go back here. Yeah, right, we're using the same kind of values here. So 2.1 was that sample difference we found. Okay. So if I go to turn this into a test statistic, right, I know it's gonna be from a student T distribution. Well, that distribution centered around zero. I found something that was above the assumed true difference. So I'm going to have a positive test statistic, right? So I automatically know my test statistic. If I go to plot it against my critical values, my test statistic is going to be somewhere over here. It's not going to be anywhere near my critical values. And for a left tailed test, right? The rejection region is the area to the left. So right away, we know that we're not going to reject the null. And it kind of makes sense because if we look at what the actual null alternative hypothesis were, well, we assume that the average difference was greater than or equal to zero. We found evidence that supports that. So of course we shouldn't be rejecting the null, right? Now we could go through the process just in case we had a different, um, you know, a slightly different hypothesis test. Like maybe we had a right tailed test instead. We would want to find our, our test, test statistic. We said we already know it's positive because it was to the right of that assumed true difference variable. But really, it's just a matter of plugging those values in. I, I mean, we've got that test statistic equation. It's a matter of plugging those values in and, and getting the computation correct. But kind of knowing what type of test we were looking at, the sample difference we found, our test statistic should have been positive, our critical value should have been negative, in which case we, we can make the rejection decision pretty easily. Where are we at in time? Any questions on that? All right, so um, I think what I had here was I had some suicide rates, but I'm gonna change what we do in Excel a little bit. Um, so if we go back, we've been using that hypoth two population hypothesis test blank file, and I have updated it. So if you go to the in-class data, I've been posting what we've been doing in class, the work we've done on the blank file in class, It'll look a little bit different than the completed folder just because I've done, or sorry, completed file because I've done a couple other things in, in class that I didn't know if I had time for or just to show you different ways of doing things. So I'll, after today's class, upload the final, you know, in class work for file. And that's probably the best one you can kind of use to, to build, to help with that homework. But we had, the last thing we went over was the difference in two means when we only had sample variances. So that was a situation where we had this really complicated formula for degrees of freedom, but at least the process of using that student T distribution is going to be very similar if we do a matched pairs example, right, where we've got only kind of, you know, the same 20 individuals, but a before and after. So the variable that I pulled here, I'm just going to actually real quick delete this just so I can explain what I was doing there. So I've got this data and it's county level, year level data. So it's the same same county, you can look at the county name, right? And I've got male and female suicide. So instead of a before and after time period, if I've got the same counties, right, the same population, but two different measures, I can look at that average difference as well, right? Like I said, more often than not, it'll be time, but here's an example where it's not, and it's kind of interesting when we look at the results, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create this difference variable, just like I did with the kind of manager productivity. I'm going to do male minus female, right? So equal sign, take the number of male suicides and subtract the number of female suicides. So probably a more appropriate thing to do here is use the rates since it accounts for like, I guess some counties could have very different male, female populations, although most of them are pretty similar, it's, you know, close to 50, 50, but it's a little bit easier to do the interpretation once we get to the end when we just use the number of suicides. So I hit enter. Now what I can do is if I go to where I get this huge plus black plus sign, if I double left click, it'll basically take that equation, copy it down and fill it in all the way to the very bottom of my data set. All right? So that was uh, once you were up here, 
kind of double clicking when you get that kind of bolded black uh, plus sign. Excuse me. So we're gonna do a couple different things. So now that we have this difference variable, you can kind of think about, I can find the mean difference, right? By simply taking the mean, which is the average function in Excel of this difference variable, right? That's all I'm doing. I can then find the variance pretty easy in Excel because I'm just looking at the sample variance, var.s, select that. Once again, as a reminder, how am I selecting this variable so quickly? Doing, uh, selecting that very first observation, control shift, the down arrow, hold all at the same time, or command shift down arrow on a Mac. Then I hit enter and it sends me back up to the, uh, where that cell, right below that cell that I was just in. Find the sample size. We've been using this count function. That's not gonna change at all. So I can very easily with things we've already done, once I have this difference variable calculated, find the mean difference that helps here, the kind of sample variance on that difference variable and then my sample size. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is build these confidence intervals. Okay. Well, if we look back, I'm basically gonna be using Excel to be my calculator, just putting this function in to Excel. Um, the only other thing I need Excel to do is find these T values. Now I could enter it all into one cell, that'd be fine. But I'm just gonna show you kind of, you know, if I did this as an intermediate, just so, I don't know, you can kind of see what's going on in the background. So if I wanna find the T value that gives me alpha over two, kind of like on either side of my, my confidence interval, I know the area in the tail and I need to find the T value, I'm working in reverse or inverse, right? T dot I and B. And that's the same thing that we did when we were looking at the difference in two um, sample means with only sample variances last class. So the area I want each side of my confidence interval is alpha divided by two. Oops, I forgot. When I'm dealing with the student T distribution, I also need to tell it my degrees of freedom. Well, it just becomes pretty easy, just my sample size minus one. Okay. Now, if I copy this down, I don't want that sample size cell uh, reference to change. I do want the alpha value to change. So I'm gonna freeze that cell reference that it, you know, where the sample size is. I forgot to do one more thing though. It's always gonna be dealing with the left side of the distribution, but my positive and negative signs are already built into my confidence interval equations. So I'm just going to take the absolute value here. Okay. Now when I copy this down, I get my T value. So that's really the same thing we did right here. The only difference was I already had my degrees of freedom calculated up here. Now with the matched pairs, I have my sample size, but my degrees of freedom is just that minus one. So if you really wanted to, you could have, you know, calculated degrees of freedom here instead, and then just kind of just use one reference. It's up, kind of up to you, um, but I decided not to do that. Okay. So from here, we're gonna find our lower and our upper bound. And just to kind of give you a, here's our alphas. So to get my lower bound, I'm just using Excel to be my calculator. Put an equal sign, I take that mean difference, I subtract the number of standard deviations the way I wanna go, or my T value, that gives me alpha over two on each side, and then multiply by the square root of my sample variance on that difference variable, divided by my sample size. Now when I copy this down, when I build different levels of confidence, the only thing that changes is the number of standard deviations away that I'm gonna go or that T value. So that's the only thing I want to like update when I copy this down. So I'm gonna freeze the cell references using F4 or Command T on a Mac. Okay. So now when I copy this down, the only thing that should be changing to get my next couple upper bounds, right, keeps these the same using the new T value, okay? How do I get my upper bound? Well, this is, as I said, the probably easiest way. Copy your formula, hit enter to get out of the cell, go over here and paste it. The only thing that's different in the upper bound equation is we're adding our margin of error instead of subtracting it. Okay. Now that I have that, I can copy you, not drag it down. I can copy that down. Now I've got three confidence intervals. This is the same, pro I mean, we've really been using the same process to build all these different confidence intervals 
going back to even when we're looking at the differences in, in proportions, right? It's just that, yeah, when we look at the lower and upper bound equations, they're going to be a little bit different, right? But it's really the same process. Okay. Any questions up to the, by anyone at this point? I want to see a cell again or... So what if we want to do some hypothesis testing? So I'm going to do, um, say the null and alternative hypothesis. So let's say I want to say is that mean difference, and here I'm not going to insert a bunch of symbols just for the sake of time. So let's say, you know, this was mu subscript D, but is that true difference greater than zero? So we'll assume that it's less than or equal to zero. Right? So just to kind of give us a, a reference of what we're doing we're going to basically be doing right a right tail test. All right, we've got a greater than sign in that alternative hypothesis. So if I want to find my test statistic. Once again, it's just using Excel to be our calculator. So we take the mean difference we found, subtract the assumed true difference. We're using zero. Divide by the square root of that sample variance divided by my sample size. So just basically clicking on, you know, writing this out in Excel and clicking on the numbers instead of having to type this into a calculator. So this should give me my test statistic. Right. Now, right away, I found a mean difference of 44 and the assumed true difference is zero. So I found something above that assumed true value. So I should have a positive test statistic. Not only is it positive, this is a crazy high test statistic. If we were hopefully we're starting to get used to these, um, at, you know, a test statistic of 39 means it's 39 standard deviations away from that assumed true value. So right away, we can probably already imagine we're probably going to end up rejecting the null here. Um, you know, I could think about what my critical values are. So let's say I wanted to do my uh, critical values down here. And we'll set up the different alpha values. So 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0.01. So if I want to find my critical values, it's very similar to what we were doing for confidence intervals. I know the area in the tail. The only difference is now the area in the tail is on the right. So kind of hopefully walk through this and make a little bit of sense. So if I try to use that T dot INV, I tell it I want alpha in my tail, comma, my degrees of freedom is the sample size minus one. Notice I get a negative critical value. Well, it's a positive or sorry, it's a right tail test, so I know the critical value should be positive. Right? So I could take the absolute value, since I know this is a symmetric distribution, and that would be fine. Or what I could do is think about, well, yeah, I want the T value that gives me alpha total in the tail, and that T value would represent my critical value that gives me alpha in the tail. Or because I know that this T dot INV function always looks at the area to the left, the area to the right is alpha, the area to the left is one minus alpha. So if instead of doing the absolute value, I just change this to one minus alpha, right? I get the same value, but now it's positive. That makes sense for this right tail test. Okay. If I want to copy this down to find different critical values for different levels of alpha, I want to make sure that that sample size reference doesn't change. So I'm going to freeze that with those dollar signs. Now I can copy this down. I've got my three critical values. I could plot these out, but you know, I mean, you know, so if I think about plotting these out and I had like, well, I'll just do it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll blow this up in a second. Hold on. So we've got what? One point, oh, here it is. 1.28, 1.64-ish, 2.33-ish. Here's my rejection regions. My test statistic is 39. I, I can't even, like I'd be drawing on the table over here, right? It's gonna be way out here. Okay. So I think about my p-value would be the area kind of to the right of that test statistic. My p-value is probably gonna be pretty close to zero. Okay. But we can go ahead and actually figure out what that p-value is, okay? Because I know my test statistic and I want the area to the right of it, right? So if I know that t-value and I wanna find the area to the left or right, I can use this t dot dist. Right? So I select my test statistic, comma, my degrees of freedom is my sample size minus one. 
and then comma one is going to tell me the area to the left. Well, I want the area to the right, so I could just do one minus that. It's kind of similar to some other tests that we've done before. I want to show you one more, and you know, the p-value is so close to zero, basically it rounds it to zero. Well, there's another function, which is t.dis.rt. So a right tail test. So you don't have to do the one minus, it does it for you. You tell it your test statistic, comma, sample size, minus one is my degrees of freedom. Now, there's a little bit difference in how these functions work in terms of their rounding. So it does look like these are different p-values, but it's really just because they are so close to zero. I'll play around with some things here in a second and show you that these really are producing the same value. It's just that once you start getting too close to a p-value of zero, the way in which they round these, one of them um, stops at a certain decimal point, the dot RT doesn't stop. So it's always gonna like, this is, you know, the, the T dot disc, once it gets close enough to zero, it just starts rounding it to zero. Whereas this goes out a few more decimals, but really they're telling you the same thing, right? That P value is pretty much zero, okay? Any questions on that? We're okay with that. Um, you know, so really what we're saying here, well, well, hold off on that. So another way I can do this, just like when I have a difference in sample means, when I had sample variances, I can use this built-in t.test formula. So what the t.test is gonna do now is I'm gonna select, okay, what two variables was I using to find this difference variable? Okay, so the first one I was using was male suicides, right? So I'm gonna select that. Now, here's where something where using this automatically select command, it's kind of a pain. Like I'm all the way at the bottom now, I've got to scroll up, right? So I selected that first variable, which was male suicides. I'm gonna put a comma. Instead of selecting that second variable, which is female suicides, I know it's in column I, and I know it has the same range. So I'm just gonna type it out so I don't have to keep scrolling up. So I2 to I1408. Or I could have just selected the female suicides, but then it would send me to the bottom and I have to scroll up to the top so I could kind of keep showing you guys this. I then put a comma. It needs to know the number of tails. Well, I'm looking at a right tail test, so I've got a one tail test. And then comma, what type of test am I running? Well, I, I no longer have two sample means with unequal variances. That was type three, that's what we used Friday. I now have a matched pairs example. So I put type one. What Excel is gonna now do is gonna take that male and female suicide variables. It's gonna find the difference for each observation. It's then gonna find the mean difference and the sample variance on that difference. It'll calculate the sample size, use all those things to calculate my test statistic, spit back out at me the p-value. Sure enough, I get this p-value that's approximately zero, okay? Any questions on that? So it's a little bit different um, than the, what we were using that t.test formula before. It's almost like it has like multiple kind of codes stored into it. Um, and as soon as you tell it it's a matched pairs example, it calculates that difference variable and goes through and does everything for you. So you know, with a p-value of zero here, if we're thinking about kind of our rejection decision, you know, I could use that if statement where I say, okay, if the p-value, and I'll just use this p-value, is less than alpha, comma, then I should be rejecting at that level. If it's not, comma, I should be failing to reject. So put the word fail. Now I wanna make sure I keep using the same p-value, but I allow alpha to change. So I gotta freeze this cell reference. That was the p-value. Now when I copy this down, sure enough, I mean my p-value is zero. I should be rejecting at every level, right? At every single alpha. So what I'm saying is that what I'm rejecting is that the difference in male and female suicides is not less than or equal to zero, right? I can, I can, you know, I can reject any value that's less than or equal to zero. Or said differently, I found pretty strong evidence that there's more male than, on, on average across these counties, there's more male than female suicides, right? The average difference is that there's 44 more male suicides than female suicides in the county. Well, I could start to think, and I won't make you guys do this on the exam or in, in your assignment, but you could start to think about things like, well, is that difference greater than 20? Can I say that on average, 
the average difference in male and female suicides in the county is greater than 20. There's 20 more male suicides than female suicides. So I changed this value to 20. Well, now notice, Oh, it's just really, still really close to zero. So notice, yeah, that my p-value updates a little bit here. It's still so close to zero that I'm going to be rejecting at all levels. But can I say that that difference is different, you know, greater than 40? So if I change this to 40, well, now I can see once I start to get these values that are further away from zero, these are, you know, it doesn't matter if I use one minus t dot dist or t dot dist to rt, I'm getting the same values here, right? Um, once those p-values get a little bit further away from zero, okay? So I still have a really low p-value. I can even at the 99% level say that I can reject the null, that the true difference in male and female, sorry, the true average difference in male and female suicides is less than or equal to 40. I can reject that, which is pretty wild <laughs> um, that we have that much of a, kind of a gender disparity in, in suicide. So, you know, I could play around. I think once I get to values like 42, I start to maybe not be able to, you know, reject the null hypothesis that's less than or equal to 42 at the 99% level. Um, but at the, you know, level 40, I can. Now, one thing you might notice as I'm changing this hypothesis, you know, my hypothesis test to different values, my p-values were, were changing, right? So was my test statistic. But this t dot test didn't change at all. So this is just like I mentioned last class, one of the flaws of this built-in t dot test is all it can do is test against the value of zero, right? That's the only time it works because any other time it's not using 40. There's nowhere for me to put in that t dot test that I want to use a value other than zero as my hypothesized true value. So it has its limitations when we're using, a, you know, when we have a zero in our hypothesis test, yeah, it makes life a little bit easier, um, but because it can only use that hypothesized true value of zero, we should know how to do this kind of the, the other way as well. Calculating that difference variable, finding the mean difference, calculating our test statistic, and then kind of using that t dot dist or t dot dist to rt to find our p-value, okay? Any questions on anything we just did in Excel? I wanna see a cell again, or, or kind of what if something had changed? Oh, did I hear someone on Zoom? No, I have my audio way turned up. Okay. So like I said, on the on your Excel, that fourth Excel assignment, I will use values of zero there. So you shouldn't have to worry about using anything other than zero. Okay. Um, I think that covers it for us today. Um, next class, we'll start looking at uh, linear regression. Um, I will, after Wednesday's class, post a fifth Excel and Connect assignment. Once again, they are, you know, if you've done the first four, I dropped the lowest, so it's almost like they're kind of optional if you did the first four. Uh, or if you have, you know, an assignment you didn't do too well on, it'll kind of be like you're doing these fifth ones to like replace whatever your worst assignment is. Um, but those will be posted after class Wednesday when we went through a little more of linear regression stuff. Um, should be no more learn smarts the rest of the, of, of the way. Uh, that will should be the final two kind of assignments that I post. And uh, yeah, we're getting close to, the, to that final exam after that. So, all right. All right. Well, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Try to enjoy uh, this beautiful weather. <laughs>